Hey, I'm Rebecca Moore, and this is Art Watch Radio on WCHE 1520 every Wednesday from 1 to 1.30. So happy you could join us. Today, is my, today my guest is artist Philip Koch. His solo exhibition at Somerville Manning Gallery is now on view through May 18th. Hey, Philip, how are you doing? Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Wonderful. Uh, before we get into it, I do want to let everyone know that Philip's show is an in-person exhibition and is on view in the gallery and open to the public. Um, we are taking precautions to make sure everyone can safely enjoy the work. Masks are required, and we are encouraging people to call ahead when possible just so we can control the amount of people in the gallery at any given time. But art galleries are a great place to be right now since it's an intimate setting with a lot of personal space. Um, okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, <laughs> Philip, we've, uh, you've created an amazing collection for this show. Can you tell us a little bit about what visitors can expect to see when they visit? Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm really excited uh, to see the show myself. It's work I've been doing the last couple of years. Uh, it's primarily landscape paintings. They're mostly large and very colorful canvases, uh, probably is about 20 pieces in all. Also, there's a few interiors and architectural pieces. In a lot of ways, what my paintings are about, Rebecca, are um, I think I'm trying to record and share some of the extraordinary moments I've had just being out in the world and uh, let other people feel a little bit of what I've felt. So I hope people come and see it. I'm glad it's been as well received as it has been so far. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, for anyone who is listening and would like to follow along as we discuss some of the Phillips paintings, all of the images of the exhibition are online at SomervilleManning.com. So feel free to take a look. Um, one thing I personally love about your work, Philip, is, is your vibrant color palette. I'm thinking specifically of um, the monochromatic blue landscapes, specifically of a painting called Radiance that has these orange treetops coming through or North Star 2, which is um, with its bright and almost neon green sky. Where does that color inspiration come from for you? Well, you, you know it's interesting, Rebecca. I think in, for everybody uh, looking at art, their favorite thing uh, is usually color, uh, and certainly it is mine, too. Uh, I have evolved a great deal over the years. Uh, years ago, my work was almost monochromatic uh, and very cautious, and then gradually it's become bolder and bolder. Uh, one of the influences was uh, at a certain point in the 90s, I started using a soft pastel chalks uh, to make color studies uh, instead of just working oil paint. Uh, and there's nothing like switching mediums to make you work outside your comfort zone. I've also done a lot of work with trying to figure out how to control color. You know, color is a little bit uh, funny. It's so powerful. It can be. Uh, sometimes I liken it to imagine going to a restaurant and ordering uh, a delicious hot soup, uh, and they bring it to you. If they don't bring you a container for this hot soup, you're in trouble. I think mm -hmm. color is a lot like hot soup. You need to mm -hmm. somehow contain it because it's it can get all over the place. So a very big part of my work to, with color really depends on the many years I've spent studying, you know, how to make dark and light shapes work together and how to make shapes that have interesting personalities. In a lot of ways, I think having darks and lights and shapes holding the color like that soup bowl uh, is the way you can get a bright color to work for you instead of getting all over the place. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and I think your I thought that was a good really... lunchtime, and now I thought it's a good lunchtime. Yes, it is, lunch isn't it? For everyone who's sharing <laughs> their lunch with lunchtime with us, exactly. <laughs> but no, I think that you mentioned shapes, and and there is a sense of kind of these like, um, oh, how would I describe it? Kind of like flatter planes with your work too, which I think gives it like this real modernist approach to it, yep. almost like Marsden Hartley or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you well, you know what's interesting? When I started painting years ago, many years ago, uh, I was an abstract painter, and I learned a lot about shape and color doing that. Uh, I think my favorite painter in those years was the famous abstract expressionist painter, Mark Rothko. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think a lot of that heritage has crept back into my work uh, in the last years. So, you know, in some ways you you never really leave your old self behind. It comes creeping Mm -hmm. along behind you. And sometimes it's a big help to you. Yeah, well, it is interesting, even with you correlating to Mark Rothko, because I, it's interesting that you say that, because his take on color and his color studies and color fields, I can see, even though you're not abstract anymore, it, I could see that translation coming through, and I never really put that together. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we're, our childhood stays with us, and I... I I, I treasure my years as an abstract painter, although they were very few. I got into realism fairly early. What made you get into realism? You know what it was, was frustration. I just <laughs> felt after a while that the paintings were starting to all look alike, that I was repeating myself. And so I started going to the art library at my college, and I looked at a book of paintings by the famous American artist Edward Hopper. And in it, uh, what I saw was very bright sunlight and these long cast shadows. And I thought, you know, that's what I'm really more about. Why don't I become Mm -hmm. somebody who paints bright light and long cast shadows? And Mm -hmm. pretty much on a dime, I turned and uh, started painting exactly that. So I I owe a great debt to art history and some of the artists that went down the road before me. Yeah. Wow. So... If you can, tell us a little bit about your process. Like, where does it all start for you? Do you have paintings planned in your head, or is it more serendipitous? And when you're driving down the street and see some interesting architecture, you're like, oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a, very much a little bit of both of what you described, mm-hmm. Rebecca. Uh, I, I think in a lot of ways, what I'm always trying to go, get after is that, you know, I think for all of us, there's sometimes where we walk around feeling confused and inadequate, but we'll see something or we'll hear something that makes us feel just for a moment like things make sense, that the yeah. parts come together, and you, you can have this wonderful sense of well-being will come over you. And I find really two things lead me to that. One is just driving around and suddenly noticing something out of the corner of my eye that just sort of calls to me and makes me excited to look at it and feel better. And other times it's looking inward, and I'll have a memory from long ago. Uh, that I just find comes back to me. Uh, In the show at Somerville Manning, uh, many of the paintings have water in them and islands. Mm -hmm. Uh, And give give you a concrete example. When I was a little boy, uh, I grew up on the shore of cold Lake Ontario in upstate New York. And it was usually very rough. Uh, And when I tried to go swimming, I get, when I was little, I get bashed on the rocks Mm. and it hurt. And I started having a dream that came uh, unbidden to me of magical islands appearing up out of the water and protecting Mm. me from these harsh waves. And I loved how that dream made me feel. And it's something that I like to dip my toe back into just as a source of an image to make paintings around. So it's a little bit of both. It's looking inward and it's looking outward, hopefully with open eyes, to stumble into something outside myself as well that's especially exciting. Hmm. Yeah, because I guess what made me ask that is because there is a variety of subject matter in the show. Like you mentioned, there's landscapes, there's um, architectural pieces, interiors. And I know from speaking with you that they are all over the place. There's a uh, not geographically, I mean, and so <laughs> and so there's a, a beach scene from Delaware. There's, you know, uh, Hopper's studio in um, Cape Cod, and there's, I believe, some architectural pieces from Nyack, New York, and so, yes. you know, it, it really covers all the bases. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny. I, I, you know, I started out in a very avant-garde art department at Oberlin College in Ohio, and uh, I think my adolescent rebellion uh, as an art student came down to suddenly falling in love with art history. And realizing that a lot of the old themes that artists from the past like to chew on are still very much alive for us and need Mm -hmm. to be revisited. Uh, One of them is just, you know, the excitement of the natural world itself. Another one is just, you know, how can humans fit into that natural world? And I think Mm -hmm. one of the ways to examine that is looking at architecture in a natural setting, which, which intrigues me. And 
And then lastly, I love painting interior spaces, looking out windows. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of a metaphor for that idea of being stimulated by the world outside us and the world inside us. So yeah. I've, I've done a lot of paintings in the Mid-Atlantic and New England uh, in places that some of the artists I admire a lot found helpful or inspirational mm -hmm. for their work. I've gone and tried to pick up on some of that inspiration. Mm. Well, and even going back to when you were talking about like humans, um, our placement in nature and vice versa, it, it brings to mind um, one of the paintings in the show, Edward Hopper's studio in Truro. And yeah. you told me an interesting story about like his involvement with the power line there and things like that. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that painting and kind of the story behind it? Yeah. No, I I have a, had a long, I've been very fortunate to have a long-term relationship with the uh, studio that Edward Hopper built way back in 1934, high up on a sand dune uh, on Cape Cod uh, in the little town of Truro. Uh, what's funny is Hopper was famous for painting this unvarnished look at industrial America. You know, he'd paint back alleys and factories and uh, loading docks, that kind of thing. And in particular, he liked to paint telephone poles and power lines. Mm -hmm. Well, years later, uh, the uh, street where he lived uh, in Cape Cod, it had no power initially. The power company came in and said, you know, we'll put a power line, uh, we'll electrify your houses, it's time, uh, and we're going to do it with um, telephone poles and power lines above ground. But if you'd like to pay extra, we'll bury the cables for you. Mm -hmm. And apparently one of his neighbors later told me that Hopper threw a fit when the other neighbors wouldn't pony up the extra money to bury the power lines because he didn't want to see telephone poles anywhere near his house. So to this day, you can see the power lines and the poles come all the way down to the edge of the hopper property, and then the cable goes straight underground. I took advantage of that in this big painting that's at Somerville Manning right now called Edward Hopper's Studio Truro where the studio is seen in the distance on a hill, and in the foreground framing it are two very tall telephone poles. <laughs> I think Edward Without Hopper a wire. Over. Without a wire, I might Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, the, you know, the other thing that's funny, Rebecca mentions it, I paint with big brushes because I'm just – they're comfortable, and you can't mm. do power lines with big brushes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a prosaic the side. To, of it, right? Yeah. You know, there, there's a prosaic side to all this too. So, yeah, so anyway, you know, Hopper's funny that he was a contradictory man. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, like all of us, you know, we have these very opposing sides within us, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is one mm -hmm. of the attractions of art and music. It's a place where things that don't fit together uh, can Absolutely. be made to, to fit together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But hey, uh, I, I, you have to lie. I love Edward Hopper. I, I was inspired to become a realist painter by Edward Hopper. But I also think it's important to laugh a little bit along with or even at <laughs> Edward Hopper. <laughs> Sometimes art is taken a little too seriously, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, yes. It, you know, it, it's so funny because, you know, I do think there's a tremendously serious side to living. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's delightful. Sometimes it's very painful. And I think it's important to have things around us that are beautiful, that give us energy, make sense. Uh, and, and that's what art at its best can do. On the other hand, uh, artists can get carried away with themselves. <laughs> that's kind of a stereotype and take themselves too seriously. And uh, it's really good to laugh at the art world uh, and, because mm -hmm. it, it's a very funny place, too, just as living is so full of well, you know, meaningful experiences and also really silly, funny experiences at the same time. Have you felt like Edward as Hopper an artist? And his, uh, like Edward Hopper and his power lines. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Have you felt? Of course, of as course. An there's nothing silly about me. I'm a, a complete, completely well, profound person I, all the time. No, of course, of course. Well, that's what I was just going to ask if you felt. Um, at times, you know, this need to kind of take yourself more seriously. But I think that as a viewer of your work, I think uh, if you took yourself a little too seriously, it would, it would lose some of that really amazing energy that is in your work. And, and I love having that energy in the gallery right now. Um, 
And so I'm, I'm glad you sometimes don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, I have a secret outlet, Rebecca. I also oh. do cartoons of cats that are only for my family members, and they're completely yeah. ridiculous. And if they ever got out in public, I'm doomed. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. Should we start finding little hidden cats in your painting or something? <laughs> if they're That's there, I'm not signature. telling. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, brother. that's funny. Um, well, we do have to take a quick break right now, but we will be right back with artist Philip Koch. EAM Radio 1520. This is Rebecca Moore, director of Centerville Manning Gallery. And today, my guest is the painter Philip Potch, whose solo exhibition at the gallery is now on view through May 8th. Um, Philip, we touched on it a little bit before the break, but I would like to talk a little bit more about your process, if you could. Do you, because I know you do some studies and things like that, but your work is, for the most part, especially the, the work in the gallery, is on a larger scale and very bright but you do some charcoal drawings as well. So do you start everything with sketches before you move on to the larger piece? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think in a lot of ways an artist can be much more experimental working at a small scale and working quickly. And it gets you to try some of the, the um, less orthodox and wilder ideas that come to you. Mm. Uh, you know, when you work on a big scale, and I, I really enjoy doing major of oh, four foot or five foot pieces as well. Um, you, they take so long that you you sort of slow down and are, are afraid a little less risk taking. So I think it's very important mm -hmm. to work at a small scale and a large scale. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm hardly the first artist to do that, um, but I mm -hmm. find it's a way to actually keep spontaneity in the process by planning a little bit. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, kind of. Um... Oh, what's I don't. It's interesting to yeah keep spontaneity by planning. It's like you have to plan to be spontaneous. I do that. I do that personally <laughs> myself, so I understand that very well. Uh, <laughs> but you were talking about um, how you know you're, about risk taking in your painting. Do you have a painting in the show right now that you believe was a risky painting? Oh golly! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, they're all risk taking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the wonderful saying by Picasso, Rebecca, that starting a painting is like jumping off a cliff. Uh, and I always identified with that very, very mm -hmm. well. Uh, with the uh, the paintings in the show, uh, one risk-taking picture in particular, uh, it's a large landscape called Mountains by the Sea. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a painting that was done up in Acadia National Park in Maine, and my wife Alice and I honeymooned there, and I loved the place, and we went back many times uh, to go painting. Uh, this is a view of the mountains as seen from the uh, outer Atlantic side, and to get the mm -hmm. view, uh, since I don't work from camera, I work from direct observation with the portable easel, mm -hmm. I had to back up all the way out in this high rocky cliff to the point where I was literally two feet from the precipice. And I'm in the habit of stepping back away from the easel to look at what I'm painting. And I had to constantly remind myself, Philip, don't back up. <laughs> so, I have was a anxiety with just you telling me that story. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, you know, it was, in some ways it was a really dumb thing to do. But, you know, we all have our moments of where our judgment lapses. But it, to get the, just the right point of view, um, I really had to do that. And I really liked how the painting turned out. In terms of risk also, you know, there's always a side, I think, of when you're making a piece of art or, oh gosh, writing even an essay, where there's some ideas that really don't fit together. And in that painting, uh, there was this very, very dark, gnarly forest in the foreground, and then a very distant, light-filled uh, mountains in the background. And getting the, this, those two areas to talk together was just murder. And what I ended up having to do was try many, many, many variations on that painting uh, to get it to come together to where it is now. So, you know, the, I, I think that in, in that sense, risk-taking means putting things together that don't necessarily want to talk to each other and mm -hmm. sort of working on them and persuading them to get into a conversation 
And when you do, the painting has like it sort of doubles its energy level. It's, you know, the whole surface is is singing at once. Yeah, definitely. And that that painting itself is, I mean, I would consider it epic in a way. I mean, there's a grandeur to it, um, not yeah. only in the in the scale of the painting, but you really do get the sense of this larger than life landscape and the energy uh-huh. of this landscape. So the fact that you put them together in such a successful way, it almost reminds me, one of my favorite words in the English language is actually sublime. And it, that, that painting and the story that goes along with that painting, it's, you know, it's so beautiful, it's kind of dangerous. And, and, and I really like that aspect of the painting. So hearing the story behind it has completely changed it for me, and I really appreciate that. Well, yeah, thanks for saying really cool. that. You know, Rebecca, you used the word grandeur uh, mm-hmm. and epic scale. Uh, I think that's one of the big themes I like to paint about is that, you know, we're very small and the world is huge. And it has a drama that just comes with it. Uh, I think that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I like to put a lot of shapes into my paintings, uh, give them bright color and uh, use a very loose brushwork is that it's a way to sort of and electrify or agitate the the image to where it's like has a lot of energy to give back to the viewer. Absolutely, you know, living is, then, is such a vital experience, and we I think uh, the art that we look at uh, needs to reflect that sometimes. Hmm. That's really beautiful, and and you know that energetic, um, you know, feeling I definitely get in your painting the reach. Um, uh-huh. which, you know, that sailboat just coming out from this darkened cove. It, I mean, I try to describe it to people, but, you know, listeners, if you can imagine <laughs> this dark, coved, rocky landscape, all monochromatic dark blues, and this bright sailboat just almost shooting out of the cove with this bright, almost neon green and yellow reflections following in its wake. And uh, to me, that should be like, uh, uh, I don't know, in a museum with the rest of the Scribner's classics and stuff. Like, I know it's not an illustration, but there's a story in that piece alone, which I think is really oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, at Rebecca, that's one of my favorite paintings in the show. It's very autobiographical. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father, um, bought a sailboat and taught me how to sail uh, on Lake Ontario. And he did this right before he died. He died when I was 13. And these are very, very special memories. Uh, He worked a lot, so he would take me sailing at night. And as a kid, I thought this was crazy. But I figured, Hmm. well, if my dad's here and he thinks it's all right, I I guess it's all right. And Mm -hmm. to this day, that's a real treasured memory for me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that painting to both reflect slightly ominous feeling. I mean, should you really go sailing on the Great Lakes at night? I don't think so. (laughs) Uh, But there's this kind of light that comes with the activity. And so I created this colorful, I was thinking of it as moonlight, but obviously I've lied Mm -hmm. about what moonlight's actual hue is. Because I wanted Mm -hmm. to warm warm something up because I have a very warm feeling. Uh, about that memory of the boat and sailing and my father. That's so beautiful. I love that. Um, Philip, not only are you an extremely accomplished painter, you also have a really great connection to art history, like you kind of mentioned on earlier. Um, Specifically, we talked about Edward Hopper, but you're also really connected to Charles Birchfield, correct? And so um, I know you've done work with the Birchfield Penny Art Center and the Hopper House and Studio. Can you tell us a little bit just about the work you've done with both those places and kind of how you got connected um, as much as you can say, obviously, with the Hopper House? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting to start with Hopper. Um, it, it, one thing that fascinates me is the, these are two artists who couldn't be more different, the painter Edward Hopper and the painter Charles Birchfield. Uh, Birchfield's uh, work is somewhat fantastic and even surreal. He's a landscape painter, but kind of a wild man landscape painter. And Hopper's a real straightforward, Yankee, down-to-earth, no-nonsense kind of painter, it would seem, although I, I secretly think he had a, a lot more... Uh, 
surprising him in that. Mm-hmm. No, years ago, the people that inherited the studio Edward Harper built on Cape Cod uh, in 1934 became collectors of my work and invited me to come to the studio. Uh, and we became family friends, and they've been inviting my uh, my wife and I to return to the uh, Hopper studio, which is in, remains in private hands, uh, to stay there and paint. Uh, so we've had so far a 17 what I call residencies, staying in this, uh, what is really a a family beach house uh, on this 80-foot tall sand dune overlooking uh, Cape Cod Bay. One thing that's really interesting about staying there is it's very much like a hopper painting. It's very sparse, uh, not a lot Mm. of detail, not a lot of adornment, and it's the wind blows and the whole house shakes, and it's a little spooky. Uh, a little bit like Edward Hopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what is, and, and one other quick in, thing I want to say about yeah. the Hopper studio. It is, um, when I first went there, I thought, oh, this is great. I'll be able to find all the places Edward Hopper painted around his studio uh, mm-hmm. right away. And so when I first got there, I went looking for the places that looked like the sources he had painted. And none of them are anywhere near the Hopper studio. And I thought mm-hmm. that was just fascinating because there were, Pretty good views all around. But I realized from that, Rebecca, that Hopper was teaching me a great lesson, and that is, you know, don't pick the first idea that comes your way to make art about. You you really need to keep searching for something that's a little better than that first idea. And in his case, it meant walking around and driving around a lot until he found something that fit his needs a little better than the views right by his studio. Uh, and I always try to take that to heart. Just keep looking, you know, find an unusual way to present an idea that put some life into it. What's also very funny to me is Hopper and Birchfield were friends, and neither one of them had a lot of friends. They knew each other from exhibiting in the same gallery in New York City. Uh, Charles Birchfield's uh, work was so different than Hopper's, but nonetheless, when Birchfield had his first show at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Hopper contributed uh, an essay to the um, exhibition oh. catalog praising hmm. Charles Birchfield. And I always thought, boy, that's fascinating because they don't paint anything alike. Uh, I also had a very wonderful thing happen. Uh, when I was in, this is a funny story. I hope you have time for this. When oh, I was a freshman in college, I went and uh, was on my first trip home to, I grew up in Rochester. I'm taking the Greyhound bus back to Rochester. I stopped in Buffalo and visited my friend from high school who was in at Buffalo State uh, College, which is where, the, where they later built the Birchfield Penny Arts Center. And I went out to drink beer with, with my friend, his new girlfriend, and the new girlfriend's roommate. Turns out the girlfriend's roommate was an art major, and I had no romantic interest in her, but I asked her out the next night so I could go back to her place and see her artwork. And I was just so intrigued to see that you could go to college and study art and studio art. I didn't know you could do that. So I finally wrote a little postcard to the director of the Birchfield Penny Art Center and told him how ironic it was that on the spot where they built his building, uh, the museum, was the spot where I decided that night drinking beer, hey, I'm going to become an artist. It's a completely true story, but it's really funny how what a casual whim it seemed to happen. You know, beer, beer fueled decision making. Yes, well, you know, often are quite interesting decisions, aren't they? So, but I'm glad that this one worked out for the better, for sure. Yeah. So the Birchfield Penny asked me to be their artist in residence. The Birchfield Penny is the museum uh, in Buffalo, New York, that's devoted to the work of Charles Birchfield and Western New York artists. So they they had me go up there repeatedly to paint uh, around areas where Birchfield painted. Uh, and uh, w- one of the big paintings in the show at Somerville Manning is, is directly from that. I know actually two of them are. Uh, the, the painting um, Late Autumn Sun is from that series I did mm-hmm. uh, while artist in residence in Western New York. Uh, they also wanted me to go through the Birchfield archives. Where they have uh, 25,000 pieces of paper that he wrote on or drew on. Uh, the guy saved everything. And I learned something very important, Rebecca, from that experience. One, it was that Birchfield was very uh, quick to go back into his early work and learn from it and even mm-hmm. borrow from it or 
to keep working on it. And this was a great news to me because I've always secretly liked to work on my paintings forever until somebody takes them out of my hands and <laughs> collects them. So here was a, an art historical example that I'm not the only guy who can't stop fiddling on his paintings because Birchfield <laughs> did it all the time. And I said, okay, well, there's an art historical precedent. I'm good to go. <laughs> That's good. At least you're not alone in that. Also, I know a lot of other artists that do that too. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We, um, well, you, you know what it's like? It's like if you have a conversation with a friend and you have a little disagreement and you walk away and the next day you think, boy, I wish I would have thought of this to say or that mm -hmm. to say. See, in art, you can go back into the conversation because it's not a person, it's a painting, and you can say what you should have said the day before mm -hmm. and make it mm -hmm. just right. Yeah, That's, that's why wonderful. art is better than real life. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. You said it. We unfortunately are running out of time, but real quick before we have to end, what can our listeners expect from you in the near future? I know what in 2020, you're having a show at the Algonquin Museum of American Art in Maine. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Maine, Maine is one of the big sources along with uh, Cape Cod and upstate New York for me. And so we're going to be traveling around the Northeast, uh, going to different places. I'll go painting. You know, because of COVID, we've kind of put traveling on hold. But um, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure where we're going to go. It's, it's, we kind of have the luxury of deciding in the next few months what lies ahead. But I'll be painting out on location and then spending a lot of time in my studio, uh, taking right. the very best of the small paintings and turning them into, you know, larger, um, grand paintings. I love that. Wonderful. All right. Well, we have to wrap up, but thanks so much for spending some time with us, Philip, today. I really appreciate it. Oh, Rebecca, thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun, and I hope people can come in and see the show. Uh, I, yeah. I think it uh, was beautifully installed in the gallery. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Koch's solo exhibition at Somerville Manning Gallery is now on view through May 8th. It is an in-person exhibition and is on view um, and open to the public. Masks are required, and we are encouraging people to call ahead when possible. We look forward to seeing you all in the gallery. Thanks for joining us today on Art Watch Radio. This is Rebecca Moore, and make sure to tune in next Wednesday from 1 to 1.30 for a new episode. Take care, everyone. <laughs>